Hi there, thanks for joining us for our first workshop called T Kids and Technology. I'm Risa, I'm part of the family engagement team. Um, there's four of us. Janelle. <laughs> I am also on the family engagement team. My name is Janelle Schultz. And then we have two other um, people on our team, Teresa and Asha. So today we are going to be talking about kids and technology. And there we go. All right, Risa, you take it away. Yeah, so how to effectively manage your child's use of technology, media, and digital consumption. So the reality, the reality is we are in a pandemic and there are some times where you feel like there's no other choice than using technology, whether that be TV, um, Netflix, YouTube, laptop, phone to get through what you need to do. And now with the cold weather and the pandemic, they're getting more screen time um, now than ever. So we're using screen time in a multiple of different ways. So definitely connecting with family because of the way things are now, um, talking to grandparents and family far away on um, screen time and things like that, the cold weather and COVID like how I mentioned, and then keeping kids busy so you can get things done and cook your dinner, clean your house, whatever it is that you're doing. And um, we understand that this is the way the world is right now. And there are some benefits, but we're just running this workshop to give other ideas, some knowledge about appropriate screen time um, and just other sort of options that we can do. We understand that technology is most often the cheaper option because you're already paying for TV, you're already paying for your phone. And it just seems like the fastest um, option in the moment. But yeah, so we just wanted to know, we just wanted to share that we get the reality of technology, especially in a time like now. Yeah, for sure. Kids are definitely watching way more screens than ever before in history. This is probably the first generation ever to have uh, the amount of, of access to digital content. Um, and it really is still uncharted territory as far as understanding what the recommendations are and knowing that the long-term effects of this on children's social and emotional development and their language development. Um, the World Health Organization actually recommends absolutely no screens of any kind for children under the age of two. And I just want you to think, does that surprise you? Does that stat come as a shock to you? Because it's so intuitive for babies and they're so drawn to, like young, young children are so drawn to um, little cartoons and screens and YouTube. Um, you know, they're, they're on their parents' phones, they're taking, they know how to navigate phones already. They, they figure this stuff out really, really young. Um, but yeah, the recommendation is absolutely no screens under the age of two. And then for children between the ages of two and five, so before they start school, we're still looking at only maybe one hour of screen time per day. And again, this is screen time of any kind, phone, tablet, computer, TV, uh, internet, anything anything that is um, not real engagement with, with um, a real person. So even their communication, maybe with family or whatever, that all counts as screen time according to the World Health Organization. That, I'm a parent myself and I know that certainly my kids watch more than an hour of <laughs> screen time a day before they are school age. Um, I realize that that is a pretty conservative number and that might come as a surprise to you, especially when you're home all day, um, as many of us are during this pandemic and um, other entertainment options are hard to come by and screen time is easy. So um, this is just a, a guideline that we want you to keep in mind as you are monitoring and limiting your children's exposure to uh, digital content. So we're gonna start uh, by talking about why is this so important? What are the risks of having too much screen time? So we do know um, that research has shown excessive screen time for kids under the age of five is one of the biggest threats to their health as it's linked with language delays, reduced attention, and low school readiness. So well, how is this affecting their health? It, it 
you know, it doesn't seem like it would be that toxic of a thing, but if you think of it, if you're sitting and watching TV, you're not active and our bodies need to move. Children need to move. They need to be exploring their world. Um, we call it a kinesthetic learning. So where they are moving and learning at the same time. And that is simply not happening when you're passively taking in information. So um, they're not getting enough physical activity, which of course leads to all sorts of other health, poor health outcomes down the road. Um, it, it, uh, when you're sitting and you're just looking at a screen, it actually affects the way that your eyes develop. Um, you're not getting the, the practice basically of looking farther ahead. You, you know, you're really only looking, you know, 12, 18 inches in front of you as you're looking at a screen is going to affect the way that uh, your vision develops. Um, it, without getting too much into the, the science of it, watching TV or um, digital stimulation actually increases your stress hormone. And it, it's kind of a subtle, you might not really notice it. You might feel like you're relaxing or your kids might feel like they're zoned out or relaxed, but in actuality, it is increasing their stress hormone. And that makes it really difficult for them to regulate that because their anxieties and their stresses are already elevated before they deal with any sort of real life stress. And uh, so that, that has a long-term effect as well. We know that stress of any kind is not good for our bodies. And, um, and if digital content or sorry, digital stimulation is contributing to that, that um, is a problem in the long run. Um, also, it affects children's ability to learn language, um, and we see language delays in children who have had a lot of um, screen time. You might think that, oh, they're still getting language, they're still hearing people talking, or they're still hearing learning English or another language um, by watching TV or watching videos. Um, but that is not how our brains are hardwired to learn language. So language is learned through face-to-face -face interaction and uh, not on a screen. It's kind of, you know, you would think it would be the same, but it's not actually. Um, and then difficulty focusing. If you've ever watched uh, a YouTube video that's geared for children, even ones that are geared for adults, they're short. They are moving between content so quickly that it programs children to have a really short attention span because they're used to having new stimulation, new information every couple of seconds. And so for them to sit and focus on a task that might take minutes or half an hour or an hour, they're just not capable of it because they're not used to it. So if you want to help with their attention and their focus, definitely reducing screens is uh, going to help. So one of the reasons that the recommendation for no screens at such a young age is there is because if you don't give it to them in the first place, they're not going to be as, as drawn to it the older they are. So before they become too attached to it, consider alternatives to help you minimize the risks of screen time before the age of five. Um, so your child and digital consumption, uh, the digital content is actually designed to be addictive and keep us coming back mm -hmm. over and over and over. So it's like I said that um, things are changing so quickly um, as they're uh, watching a video, the content moves so quickly and producers of this content are really smart. They know how to um, keep us addicted to this um, by moving things along and, and uh, structuring the way that this content is delivered in a way that is really, really addictive to our brains. Uh, it's even a struggle for adults, I think, to mitigate their digital consumption, much less for a child's brain to be able to do that. So the child's brain doesn't have the same kind of logic and executive functioning. That's what we call the ability to uh, regulate or rationalize things. A child doesn't have that skill yet. They're still learning how to do that. And so if it's hard for us to manage our digital consumption, Imagine how much harder it is for a child to manage their digital consumption when they don't have the same brain functioning that we do. So, um, you know, you might think that your child is really engaged because they're sitting still, they're quiet, maybe it's the only time of day they're not bouncing off the coaches or, you know, 
driving you crazy running around the house. So you might think, oh, they're being good or they're being, they're um, relaxed or they're learning or whatever when they're sitting and watching TV. But in, in reality, it's, um, they're, they're addicted. They're uh, zoned out and their brain is just getting this sort of addictive feedback that um, is not something that we really want to encourage with kids. So what we really wanna see is our children's uh, neural pathways, the other neural pathways strengthened and developed through real live interaction, real play, exploring their world in real time, um, not passively taking that in on, on uh, uh, digital content passively like that. Using screen media with young children. So like Janelle was saying earlier, um, it's, it is hard to tell when you think the child is learning and it's an educational show or educational game on your phone. It's easy for us, for us as parents to be like, oh, it's okay. It's been, you know, over the one hour. It's okay. They're learning. There's a benefit. Um, but like she was saying, there is actually no comparison to us as um, adults and parents interacting with our children. So even if you're using the screen, but then you're talking about it, using those vocab words, oh, the frog is hopping from one lily pad to the other, and you're explaining using words, um, this is what you need to do, and explaining it is still way better than just having them sit and do it on their own. Um, watching together so you can use those vocab words and talk about it um, helps also. So maybe this is the first time that um, in the show there's been a river. You guys have never came across a river. Then you're driving across in real life and you see a river. You guys remember the show we watched this morning? There's a river and you can be bridging things from the screen world to the real world. And then you can sort of get more benefit and um, benefit out of screen time that's still based on interactions with you because that is actually the key for these children learning um yeah that one mind you know yeah okay so what can we do instead <laughs> so there are um a lot of things coloring and crafts that you can grab from the dollar store, which is, thank God for dollar stores, there's lots of coloring and crafts, even um, little activities and one-time things or special things you guys can pick up together from the dollar store. They could be quite inexpensive, even things you can use again and again. Um, you can read books together, play music and dance which is also a tricky one because I just learned with my son about playing music. So I just started playing music videos. It is still screen time. So I have just um, made a mistake with that one myself because I thought we're playing music, but still he's dancing and we're listening to music, but then I still find him looking at the screen and zoning out. Mm -hmm. So when we say play music, learn from me. <laughs> I say um, like play music just with lots of, TV, um, I don't know what's the word, like adapters have where you just play music against a blank screen or just like a black screen or one picture, uh, that or off your phone um, so that they're not staring into it because uh, that was a mistake. <laughs> and then um, you could also go outside instead or get them involved in whatever you're doing. So children, um, we have a lot of things to do as parents and we're doing chores, it feels like nonstop. But when they're doing chores with you, they're not seeing it as chores. They're seeing it as helping their mama, helping their papa and spending time with you. So even if um, you're helping or they think they're helping you fold laundry or they think they're helping you um, sweep up, although um, it's chores, they're doing something with you and it's still a benefit. Uh, helping them cook, obviously age dependent, but they can still pour, let's just say, from the can of beans into the pot before you put on the stoves, like small things like that. It's hard uh, when they're really young, but it still gives them some interest in food, which is also good. Um, and then helps them do tasks and helps them be involved with you, what you're doing, new words, and also just other things to do other, so you can also get your tasks done, but with them along with you. Yeah, and I think it's 
there's always that temptation as parents to turn the TV on because you need to get things done. Because who are we kidding? It is way more efficient to fold laundry quickly by yourself than it is to involve your, your preschooler in the process. So really work to find a balance between your own efficiency and your own needs. And maybe you do need that hour of screen time to happen right before dinner so you can get dinner on the table. Um, but balance that with this understanding that maybe it'll take a little bit longer, but it's worth it to involve your child in whatever it is that you're doing because that this is how they learn and this is how they grow and it builds your bond and your attachment together. And those things are infinitely more important than whatever you know tasks that you need to accomplish. If it means that your house stays a little bit dirty, it's still worth it because that means that you spent time with your child and it means that your child wasn't just zoned out in front of the TV for um, you know, that time. So really, I just really, really encourage you, even though when I know it's difficult, like I said, I'm a parent, I've been there, I know it's really difficult, but it's worth it to invest that extra energy into, okay, turn, turn the TV off, turn the iPad off, what can we do together? Come and join me. Um, encourage them, invite them. They're looking for connection. They're looking for stimulation. Um, they're, it, it's more, it's harder. I get that, but it's worth it. So it, while we really encourage you to try all these other strategies that don't involve screen time, and we have talked a little bit about how you can use screen, screen time effectively together, I just wanted to bring up a few other strategies that you can sort of use in your house and look to implement just to support the a healthy relationship with digital consumption and a healthy use of screens in your home. Uh, really important to implement screen-free meal times. Uh, so that means not eating in front of the TV, no phones or iPads or devices at the table while you're eating. Um, make a really conscious effort to focus on your food, even for yourself. This is a really important um, health strategy to help you be more mindful about what you're eating and to enjoy your food more. Everything just tastes better when you're not distracted. So um, it also encourages your children to talk to you during meals. So you sit down and you eat together and you're, you can communicate, you can be goofy, um, spend that relationship building. This is another opportunity to not just have that constant distraction of a screen. So um, there's, there's one goal that you could work towards a screen for meal times. Um, also, just bear in mind that screens are not toys. Toys are toys. Screens are something totally different. And really get creative about what kind of toys you actually have in your house. A phone is not a toy. An iPad is not a toy. Toys are toys. So anything can be a toy outside of that. It could be your um, drawer full of containers in your kitchen. It could be a, a sink full of water that they can splash in and help you wash dishes. It could be um, their actual toys and bring out their actual toys, find fun new ways to play with it. Um, really make playing with whatever, playing, playing whatever, <laughs> actively um, using language, all those sorts of like actual play strategies, that is your number one priority, not screens. So play should be your default, not more digital content or digital um, consumption. Can I add, Janelle, about toys? Yeah. yeah. Um, you don't need a lot of toys. No. I think that parents feel that, oh, they don't have a lot of toys and then we're keep buying and buying children all these toys. They actually don't need a lot of toys. And I think they... I think the less toys they actually have a better, um, what's it called? The tension span, right, Janelle? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. You, you don't need heaps of toys in your house to think that now, now my children can play. They can play with yeah. anything. Totally. Has your son discovered like your pots and pans? Every day, yeah. every single day. <laughs> every day. <laughs> These are just things we have in our kitchen and Sure, let the kids play with them, right? Those are <laughs> yeah. fantastic toys. It's loud, it's messy, but it's worth it. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, also make it a habit to not have the TV on as background noise. I know um, as sometimes as adults, especially if you're home alone all the time, somehow TV kind of feels like, or having that background noise just kind of feels like connection or distraction maybe. It's... So I, I get it that maybe you want to have that on in the background, but 
um, there's a few reasons why that's not great when you have children in the house. For one, it tends to become their default then is the second that they're bored, they're back watching that screen. Like Risa said, you know, they're dancing to music, they're having fun, and then he figured out that there is actually a video happening on the phone and that looks like more fun. And the kids just like it, default to watching TV because it's easy, it's passive, it's like I said, designed to be addictive. So if you always have the TV on in the background and you say, okay, kids, time to go play, they might go play for 30 seconds. And then something on the TV catches their attention and they're zoned right out again. So if you can avoid having the TV on as your like default, um, that is going to help a lot to uh, reduce your screen time. Um, if you feel like you need background noise, music is good. Um, silence is even better. And, and this is kind of an interesting thing that I have seen with my own children and I've learned is that when children are learning language and they're learning how to communicate, they actually aren't able to hear language in the same way that we do. Their brains aren't able to distinguish between background noise and spoken language in the same way that adult brains do, because we've learned how to figure out how to hear somebody's conversation in a, in a busy room, or like, say you're at a restaurant, and there's lots of background noise, you can still hear a conversation. You can pick out those words from across the room, probably. Kids' brains, just it's harder for them to discern what's language and what's white noise. So they aren't getting that language um, absorption in the same way when there's a lot of background noise. They just sort of end up tuning everything out. So they're not going to hear you. So that explains why if you have a lot of background noise and you're trying to get your child's attention, you might need to start like raising your voice or getting in there, you know, waving at them to get their attention because they just, they don't understand that you're calling them. Um, so the more that you can have silence as your default, as the, the background noise in your home, the more that's going to help them with their communication skills as well. Um, also really, really important for both kids and for adults is no screens before bed. Screen time, like I remember I mentioned earlier that um, digital input and screens activates the stress hormone in your body, and it actually affects your body's ability to produce what's called melatonin, which is the sleep hormone. It's, a, it's something that your body produces naturally when it's time to go to bed and that's what helps you fall asleep and stay asleep. So if you are finding that your child's not going to bed, you are finding that you are having problems falling asleep or that you are having problems waking up in the night or your child's having problems waking up in the night, it could be because your brain is kind of fried from being on screens before bed. So I believe the uh, recommendation is no screens for two hours before bed. It might be a little bit less than that for adults, but for kids, no screens before bed. And that is really going to help. So maybe um, let's say your child goes to bed at 7.30, maybe just no screens from like supper time till bedtime. And um, try it out as an experiment and see if you notice improvements in their bedtime routine and in their behavior. Excellent alternatives, of course, read a book together, play in the bathtub, or let them play in the bathtub for a really long time. Um, lots of cuddles, lots of talking. Um, just take that extra time with them without any digital input. Taking an iPad to bed is not going to set them up for success for falling asleep. For one, because then when you take it away, oh, they're going to freak out. For two, their brains are just like wired, 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 going to have a hard time falling asleep. Um, for three, it's reinforcing that addictive behavior we don't really, you know, that's not going to help them in the long run. Um, another strategy to keep in mind, uh, and again, I know this is difficult in such a digital world right now, we are glued to our phones, everything that we're doing, especially in a pandemic when we can't do anything in person, like this group, <laughs> um, is that as adults, we are on a device a lot, a lot more than we ever have been before. So really bear in mind, what kind of behavior are you modeling? Do you, are you looking at your phone every time that your child tries to talk to you? Or are you able to put it away when, you know, the family's in the living room and you're, you're having that moment? Um, do you communicate with your partner? Are you communicating with your friends and loved ones um, in, in person um, instead of having a phone screen that you're staring at? Um, 
Are you able to find other hobbies and activities and healthy things for you to do for your own self-care that doesn't involve digital consumption? Uh, maybe they see that you like to exercise. Maybe they see that you like to do a craft or play an instrument or do something else that is a skill, something that you love to do, something that nurtures you, um, your own hobby uh, that doesn't involve passively taking in media consumption. Those are all excellent ways for you to for one, care for yourself, um, and for two, to uh, model that excellent uh, role model, that digital behavior for your own kids so that they learn that there's lots of other things in the world that we could be doing other than, you know, watching this YouTube video of somebody opening a present. That's like really popular with kids to watch those kinds of shows where like other kids are playing, but they're not experiencing that themselves. So how can you um, get them to experience that themselves? Um, so that is all that we have for you today. Thank you so much for joining us or for watching uh, this workshop on kids and technology. Uh, if you have any questions or you want to reach out, please email us at familyengagement at abcheadstart.org. Uh, if you want to watch out for other Monday workshop programs that we have coming up, uh, go check us out on ABC Head Start website under family programs and you'll see there's a calendar that has all of our upcoming workshops um, next, we have Alberta Health Services is going to be talking about sick, sick kids, hand washing, germs, really, really applicable right now. We also have uh, a session on managing challenging behaviors. We're going to talk about transitions. We're going to talk about temper tantrums. Uh, we also have uh, Credit Counseling Services of Alberta coming to talk to us about uh, money management. We have all kinds of things. Che so check back regularly on the website, see what's coming out, and uh, we'd love to have you join us for another one of our sessions. Also, we have our virtual uh, parenting caregiver groups every Wednesday. Come and join us for that. It's a chance to meet other parents. Uh, it's done online. Um, but it's a, a great chance to just meet other families of ABC Head Start and uh, talk about issues that uh, are affecting you at this stage of life. Uh, we also have some parenting courses coming up. We have one called Building Stronger Kids, which is just talking a little bit more about that parent-child bond and attachment and how to strengthen that so you can see the good behavior and the um, results that you want in your parent-child relationship um, down the road. So uh, thank you very much. Risa, did you have anything else that you want to add? No, I didn't. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, so thank you for joining us and we will see you next time on our Monday workshop.